You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Who Did What Now, the history podcast that's not your history class, with me, your host, Katie Charlwood, history harlot and reader of books. Apparently, now I have to do a disclaimer at the beginning of every episode. So here we go. If you have an issue with my proclivity for profanity, you might want to get the fuck out. Because if my use of language is more of an issue to you than the horrible atrocities which I describe many times, then, pal, I do not know what to tell you. You need to sort out your priorities. Okay? Okay. Also, when I add there's like a trigger warning for this episode, I'm going to be discussing uh, suicide and child mortality and addiction and murder. You know, violence against women. There's all of that involved in this. Thought you should know. Now, how are things with me? Well, you know, things have been really good. I had uh, an article appear in the newspaper, which was pretty cool. Uh, when I was discussing Gronje Wheel and the importance of, you know, giving women their names back and their stories back. And so I was chatting to this journalist and I mentioned that, oh yeah, no, I'm covering the five canonical victims of Jack the Ripper. Because, you know, their stories are important to me. Frankly, the lives of five women shouldn't matter less than some dude we don't even know. Oh, if you're in the States, I'm going to be at the Heartland Pagan Festival. My brain just skipped a beat there. And I'm at the Pagan Festival in Kansas into the night. It's the Memorial Weekend. I am really bad with dates. Did I tell you that? I'm like awful with dates. Not just the ones I go on. But yeah, <laughs> my mum actually said to me, you know, if you go on a date with someone, it'd be nice if you actually had a second one. Thanks, mum. Love that. Love that voter confidence there, mum. That's great. I mean, she's not wrong. Not by any stretch of the imagination. I'm I'm not doing well in the dating department, really. It's, it's, I don't know. Well, here's the thing. I mean, if I am too much. Yeah, what, the last day, one of the last dates I was on, my mum was like, were you a bit much? And I'm like, well, clearly, yes. It's me. Like, I don't, mm, I don't do that kind of stuff, like, uh, half-heartedly. So I am too much, I mean, you know, is, is she a manic pixie dream girl or is she just neurodivergent? Who's to say? But here's the thing, like, if I am too much, you are well within your means to go and find less. Bye-bye. You know, it's just go. It's cool. But... Yeah, it's been, it's been, it's been not great for me in the romance department and I don't know if it's going to get any better. I don't know. Um, oh, it was Mother's Day. It's uh, Mothering Sunday, as it's called, and it's here in UK and Ireland, right? And uh, so I got two cards, uh, one of which is a lift the flap situation uh, with like, I had to kind of like follow a path of flowers to reach a flower pot, which was like, haha, I pranked you, but also I love you, which is nice. I mean, I'll take it. Thanks, son. And uh, my girl made me this, uh, she made me this card and it had like cut out unicorns on it. But it also had a drawing of me on the inside with um, one tiny arm, one big mama arm and um, a snout, which is fine, I guess. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, sweetie. And um, googly eyes. So everything was forgiven with the googly eyes. I love googly eyes. Googly eyes. Who doesn't love googly eyes, though? Like, that's well good. So my children know me, at least. They have fun cards, and it was good. Um, also, you know, all per me, per, per little mother over here. You know, if you want to donate uh, <laughs> and help me celebrate Mother's Day belatedly, uh, paypal.com slash who did what now? <laughs> or is it who did what now pod? I don't remember. Link is in the description down below. <laughs> Help me pay for all of these ridiculous old newspaper subscriptions I have. Do you know how many old newspapers I read? It is ridiculous. I mean, it's fun because I do enjoy it. But also, 
I I am I am too many. And also books. Buy buy too many books. But it's for reference. I need it. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking quit your jibber jabber and fact me. In fact you I will. But first, we've gotta get our source on. Jack the Ripper, just the facts by Paul Begg. Life and Labour of the People in London, Religious Influences by Charles Booth. Habitual Drunkards Act of 1879. The Story of the Household Cavalry by Sir George Arthur. The Prostitute's Body, Rewriting Prostitution in Victorian Britain by Nina Atwood. The Five by Halley Rubenholt. The Memorials of the Hamlet of Knightsbridge by George Henry Davis. Family Secrets, Living with Shame from the Victorians to the Present Day by Deborah Cohen. Living in Sin, Cohabitating as Husband and Wife in 19th Century England by Ginger Frost. And of course, we have History.com and Biography.com. I use it uncomfortably. Good. Then let's begin. Dark Annie, or Annie Chapman, as she will be at one day, Mrs. Sevy. Ah, she is yet another woman to suffer under the fucking Victorian shame regime. And also, you know, society, culture and mental illness, which is super fun, super fun. Now, ah, the more I read into these stories and the more I'm digging through research, just the angrier I've become, like, I'm just enraged, like... I know we can turn around and be like, things are so great now. Fuck off. Don't start that. Just because things were shit 100 years ago doesn't mean they're perfect now and I don't have time for your bullshit, frankly. But Annie's story is so fucking tragic. Like so many of these women who were just insulted and downtrodden and destroyed in life and in death. And any attempt to reclaim their name or their personhood is shat on and spat on by fucking ripperologists. Anyone who calls himself a ripper's... Yeah, bleh. Mm, that was good. Chewed on my words, but I'm mad, so I'm going to keep it in. Anybody who refers to themselves as a ripperologist is a cunt. And I don't say that lightly because they have no respect for the women and their suffering. And this is from someone who wanted to be a ripperologist. Like, I am fairly certain that in one of the drawers in my bedroom right now, there is a whole thing about the possibility of the suspects of Jack the Ripper. Like, I have a whole thing on it. I've uh, I've had books on it. I could probably tell you too many, too many locations of where stab wounds happened in certain people. Like, I know far too much about this case. And I fell for a lot of the nonsense too. Because a lot of the information we were given was regurgitated by the press, you know? This was a time where newspapers would last like a week sometimes. I say a week, maybe a couple weeks. And then some would last for ages. And bias and prejudice and everything that goes with it all flung in together. And of course, ha, huh, hmm. A less than savoury police force. I know you're shocked. You're shocked. But I am getting ahead of myself. And I think it's time to turn back and talk about the person. Annie Smith was born in September 1841. There or thereabouts. We're not entirely sure exactly of her day of birth, but roughly. See, the thing about Annie is she was illegitimate because she was born to Ruth Chapman and George Smith. Now, George Smith was a member of the cavalry. He was a soldier. He was a pretty good one, you know. And the army had this thing back in the day that, you know, they, they, I mean, they were, didn't have that much money. So they didn't want them to be, you know, cohorting with ladies of the night. And instead they wanted them to have, you know, good working class girlfriends, right? But the intention was to never marry them, you know. And 
yeah, so it was like a kind of level of respectability. Because uh, at the time, I think the only approved, like one in, no, that's wrong, six, yeah, six in every hundred marriages were like approved. So you would have to be really fucking lucky to get it approved. Now, by all accounts, George must have been, you know, just very well liked by his commanding officers because after uh, two years of being together, he is allowed to marry Ruth. But not only that, not only is their marriage approved, but it was backdated in the military records to make it look like they had been, you know, married longer and to basically state that Annie was legitimate. So Annie Eliza Smith, she's born. Five months later, Ruth is pregnant again because clearly George and Annie had some uh, great passion, right? They clearly had love. So growing up, Annie is, she's an army brat and this family, they live in the barracks, like, because at the time, you know, separate housing for army wives, military wives, wasn't a thing. So they would be, like, in the corner of a room, and sometimes it would be, like, I want to say, like, a curtain, like, some kind of, you know, barrier. But army wives, they would wash and breastfeed and do all the other stuff in front of other soldiers. Now, I'm not saying this is the safest environment, but uh, uh, it's going to be one of two things, right? And it, it's either going to be like really fucking dodgy because, you know, blood is thicker than water, which by the way, is a thing about soldiers. It's about going into battle together. So the brotherhood of, you know, the cavalry, whatever the fuck, they would either be standing up for themselves and, you know, turn a blind eye to shit happening or they would be so close and bonded that, you know, they would hold each other accountable and they would ensure the safety of each other's families because it's very much, you know, this special little bubble. Like, it, it's a particular type of community. So, Annie growing up, Jesus, I mean, proper army brat, they live in like 12 different places because, you know, you're in the army, you don't get to have a say in where you're going. Luckily, he wasn't posted abroad. Again, I think he just had like a really good relationship with his commanding officers. So 12 locations, but didn't have to like go out to the desert or the jungle, which I think is, you know, I mean, that's, that's a silver lining. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So growing up, Annie would have been sent to this regiment school. So unlike a lot of other working class women or children, like she would learn to like read and write. And then I think at like some point during the day after they did like, you know, general learning, like boys would go and do one thing and the girls would learn skills like knitting, crochet, embroidery, all that jazz. Because... Of course, women's work, proper lady things, right? Proper Victorian ladies were supposed to know how to embroider and other such uh, amazing qualities. I say that as if I don't embroider myself. I do it. I do embroider. Like, um, I embroider. I, I can't crochet. I can just about knit, but I can weave and I can, uh, what was the other one I can do? Knit, weave, embroider. And I can darn. So like, I can do Listen, it's good to have skills. Just, you never know when they're going to come in handy. When the apocalypse comes, I'll be, I mean, I'll be reading uh, old houses for clothes, but I can mend things. It's fine. I'm not saying I'd survive the Hunger Games, but you know, I'd, I'd survive winter. But anyway, the good thing is because of her father's regiment, you know, she's staying in some pretty decent places. She's in Knightsbridge, she's in Windsor. So she's at least adjacent to society. So Annie grows up to be well-mannered and polite and well-spoken and a fairly respectable Victorian girl, you know? And things are going okay. I mean, it's not 
the best of situations. But at one point, I think in about 1854, when Annie's 12, they're living in a shared accommodation with like two other families, which is, you know, pretty good. Unfortunately, a disease is spreading through the city. Scarlatina, as it was called, which is scarlet fever. So scarlet fever is spreading through and at 12 years old, Annie watches four of her siblings die. And if that isn't tragic enough, it's over the course of three fucking weeks. Three weeks. She loses her two and a half year old sister, Miriam, followed quickly by her five month old brother, William. The next to go is her five year old brother, Eli. And while Eli is being buried, her other brother is diagnosed with typhus. So George Thomas, he is, he's like he's either just turned 12 or he's about to be 12. He's on the cusp and he passes away. Four of her younger siblings, because she's the oldest, So her brother, who she grew up with, who she's known her whole life, he's gone. The little sister who she probably would have been looking after while her mum, you know, cared for her newborn. She's gone. The new baby of the family, he's gone. And her five-year-old brother also gone. Three brothers and a sister. So, four out of the six Smith children wiped out in three weeks. And, you know, child mortality and infant mortality isn't exactly, you know, unsurprising in the era. Doesn't make it any less rough on the people that are there. Like, it might have been a part of life, but it's still going to be absolutely fucking gut-wrenchingly horrific to lose a child. Now, a few years later, in 1861, another brother enters the scene. Her mum gives birth to Fontaine Hamilton Smith. He's named after two commanding officers that George Smith had. Clearly, he respected them and they must have been very... They must have mattered, you know, to name his son after these people, it had to be a reason. It can't just have been that they were there, you know? But again, army life. They must have been there for him and his family in some way during this time. Like, they would have had to hire doctors that they couldn't afford. So I have a sneaking suspicion that one of the captains, one of these fellas, they helped You know, because also funerals, not free. So I have a feeling there was some kind of contribution there. Oh, goodness. So yeah, before, before Fontaine comes onto the scene, Annie is graced with three more sisters. Emily, Georgina and Miriam. Clearly they like that name because they named a second child that, but okay. I I think it's weird, but to each their own. They were, I'm assuming there was a good reason for this. But, you know, by the time Annie is 15, chances are, you know, school's ending. So that's normally the point where she would be expected to go and do other work. And she had a younger sister who could take over the household. So care for the little ones, help her mum out. So there really wasn't a reason for Annie to be there. So Annie gets a job as a domestic servant and by 1861, she's actually a housemaid, a loving domestic servant for a 67-year-old successful architect and his retired brother. So William Henry Luer and whatever his 
retired stockbroker brother's name is Mr. Lure. I don't know his name. I couldn't find it. But she was living at their address. She was a domestic servant. And she was like the the bottom of the rung. So she was one of three like housemaids. And there would have been two above her. So they would have paid her, you know, a fairly okay wage for the time. But they would have taken like a wee bit off for live in. And then they would have given her basically an allowance where she would buy things for herself like sugar and tea and beer. Why is the beer relevant, Katie? Why do you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked because I will tell you. Alcohol is going to be a constant in Annie's life. And she's working a lot. She's far away from family. And she would have got time off to go to like Sunday mass, to go to church, because, you know, Victorians and their piety. But other than that, very little free time. And the free time she did have was probably quite lonely. I mean, there were two other domestics there. But this is a woman who grew up in army barracks and a large family and sharing houses with other people. So, I mean, this is really going to be one of two ways. Again, two ways, isn't it? She's either going to be quite happy that she had privacy and time to herself. Or she's going to feel secluded and separated from her family and really bloody lonely. And already as a teenager, this girl has suffered trauma. Like, you don't see so many people die and have it not affect you. Speaking of trauma, George Smith had been in the army for, what, 21 years of his life? More than that, actually. But for 21 years, it had been his life. The second regiment lifeguards had been everything that George and Ruth and their family would have like been a part of for the majority of their time together. So when he gets to a certain point and a certain age and he has to retire, because of how well he's held in regard and how well he's done and he hasn't caused any shit, he gets a really good position as a gentleman's servant. So a gentleman's valet is, and it is valet, not valet, valets do cars, valets look after gentlemen. They sort their clothes, they take care of them, like a personal assistant They're like above a butler, really, if one can afford a butler. But in the hierarchy of like servitude, being a valet is its pretty high up there. You're doing well. You are tip top. So he gets into the service of a Crimean war hero, right? Roger William Henry Palmer, who ends up being elected to parliament, right? He's a member of parliament. Being a gentleman's valet to, you know, a member of parliament, that is, that is a very comfortable life, you know. But I say comfortable life compared to, you know, other, you know, servantry. Servantry? That's not correct. Other forms of servitude, back-breaking labour, you know. This is, you know, this is upwardly mobile, especially for their station. So... He gets to do things that he couldn't do before and he ends up with a lot more free time. And this is a man who was surrounded by people and is now no longer surrounded by people. So he's gone through a major life change. He's experiencing more alone time and he's probably having to come to terms with all the shit he's gone through in his life. On the plus side, because he's with the Palmer man, the Palmer man, what the fuck? Anyway, he gets to travel to like Mayo and Ireland and go to castles and estates and manors and gets to just travel a wee bit, see the world, get to taste their lovely beverages like whiskey and other such delights. See, George, unsurprisingly, is an alcoholic and you're thinking, wow, that came out of nowhere. It is what it is. But think about it. Victorian era, suffered trauma. 
everything has booze in it or probably amphetamines. They're like, hey, you got a drinking problem? Take cocaine. No, not cocaine. Raisins. No, no, it's cocaine. Um, It's an old joke, but it's a goodie. And, you know, heroin, opium. Like, you, they were just like, you're addicted to this? Take this other addictive substance. It's fine. It's really fucking weird, but okay. I mean, they didn't understand how that worked, but just, you know, get, get, to say one thing is a gateway drug is more less than a correct. It's more drugs. Everything has drugs. Ah, you're drinking drugs. Take the drugs. So, yeah. He has more alone time. And uh, things clearly are starting to weigh on him. Plus, when he was in the barracks and he was with other, other soldiers, drinking was probably very much the norm. It's what people did. It's, you know, social interaction. Alcohol is the social lubricant, so they say. So him drinking a lot wouldn't have been you know, out of turn. But over the years, things get worse for George. And the promotion he gets doesn't help. So he ends up um, valeting for Captain Thomas Naylor Leyland. And uh, things, things go well for them. He's a really good valet. He's very well respected. And he is really well paid. So for him and Ruth, this is fabulous, you know. But on the 13th of June, 1863, Captain Leyland, he's acting as a steward um, at these races in Wrexham, right? Yes, Wrexham. And he's staying in officer's quarters and George is staying in this pub. He's staying in a room at a pub in Elephant and Castle. And he's, you know, going to bed for the night. He seems quite cheerful. Everybody seems fine. But when they go to look for him in the morning, they find George in a pool of his own blood. Because George has ended his own life. And not in a careful way, not in a quiet way, not in a pleasant way by any stretch of the imagination. And you're thinking, a pleasant way? You know, people take sleeping pills and things. There's easier ways to go. This man slit his own throat. Now, I'm going to stop for a moment to talk about mental illness and addiction, mainly depression and suicidal thoughts, because it can just be a fleeting moment, a tremendous moment of despair. But that moment can be all it takes to snuff out all of someone's existence. And... The pain and absolute torture someone must be going through to cut their own throat. Like, that is vicious. Clearly this man was suffering and whether the signs were there or not, his life is over. And this is going to affect everyone in his life, including, again, his daughter, Annie. Annie who has not only watched, again, four of her siblings die, but now she knows her father has ended his own life. And this is Victorian London. This is, you know, blasphemy, a sin. This is horrific. So not only does she have that to contend with, she will have this Christian guilt and shame just smothering her. And... Addiction in family? It's usually hereditary. Not usually. I mean, quite often it's hereditary. I'm not going to make any judgments. Um, but it's quite possible that this is the trigger for her. That this is the moment that Annie also starts taking solace in a bottle. Now, they do put him down as, you know, suffering from temporary insanity and that George is fond of a drink. But something peculiar happens because Ruth and her children, like Annie's family, could have very easily ended up in a workhouse. But clearly George had been well respected because Leyland, 
he had provided some money and then somehow Ruth ends up having a a boarding house like and at some point after her receiving this boarding house a young coachman named John Chapman comes to stay. Now we don't know how Annie came to meet John Chapman but we do know that somehow their paths crossed whether she was visiting the lodging house or she was staying there but they met they made a connection they courted and they got married. May 1869, the Chapmans are wed, and Annie was now Mrs. Annie Chapman, the wife of a gentleman's coachman, which is a step up, like she is working her way up in the world because, again, this is a very awkwardly mobile situation. In 1870, their first child was born. Now, instead of, you know, having her mum come to her, Annie goes back to her mum's house to, you know, as, as soon as she feels like labour's happening, she's like, nope, <laughs> fuck this for a game of soldiers. I'm off to my mum's. And off she goes and she gives birth to her first daughter. So little Emily is born, um, but Emily suffers from epilepsy. Now, at the time, this would have been connected to maternal drinking. So if somebody was drinking alcohol, you know, while pregnant, this kind of link was made to epilepsy. In 1872 a second daughter is born Ellen Georgina and she passes away in less than a day. She doesn't survive the day. And in 1873 Anna Georgina she's born with fetal alcohol syndrome. And as someone who has seen this firsthand, not my own kids, my kids are little tanks. <laughs> but um, like it's fairly recognisable. And in an era where booze and drugs were just being thrown at you hand and foot, it's not fucking surprising. I mean, the Victorian era, no offence, really fucking depressing. Like great advancements, but also shit times. But yeah. Being a part of a royal family might seem enticing, but more often than not, it comes at the expense of everything else, like your freedom, your privacy, and sometimes even your head. Wondery's new podcast, Even the Royals, pulls back the curtain on royal families, past and present, from all over the world, to show you the darker side of what it means to be royalty. From icons like Grace Kelly, Oscar winning actress turned princess of Monaco, who the world saw as the ultimate good girl. She mastered playing a happy wife and mother, but beneath it all, she was desperately lonely. Grace spent her whole life working towards perfection, and it ultimately cost her her happiness. Or King Ludwig II from Bavaria. He was only 18 when his father died, leaving the crown to him and a duty to rule that he never wanted. He refused to lead and used the funds from the royal treasury to further his extreme love of opera. But this choice eventually cost him the crown and his life. Follow Even the Royals on the Wondery app, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge Even the Royals ad-free right now on Wondery Plus. Georgina, she's born in 1876. She's born in April, and she dies in May. So the first eight years of their marriage, you know, Chapman, he's working in London. He's there. John is a coachman. Things are going well. But, you know, it, it's fine. But he does uh, get a better position and gets to leave London. But just before they go, Annie gives birth to George William Harry in 1877 and he passes away, I think, early January in 78. In July 1879, she gives birth to Miriam Lilly and 
she dies at 10 weeks old. In 1880, John Alfred, he's born and he suffers from paralysis. Now, according to Annie's sisters, all of this is because Annie drunk. Now, Annie's family, a lot of them are part of the temperance movement. They're like so sober, anti-alcohol. And as we know, alcohol in Victorian times is seen as like big massive sin. There's all the shame and guilt and everything that goes along with it. And yeah, when John gets a job being a coachman or possibly a stud groom, we're not entirely sure. By the time he's there and working for the Barrys who knew money but wanted to be impressive. So they had lived like pretty close to the royals and then they had this estate out in the countryside. Now they stayed out in this estate and they even hosted they even hosted royalty at times, the Barrys obviously. Uh, but for Annie, things weren't great because Annie consistently used alcohol as a crutch. And Annie, not a mean drunk, not an angry drunk. She just seemed to be sad. Which, given everything she's gone through, I'm not fucking surprised. She's upset. She's sad. She's often found wandering so the police would find her just kind of about she'd be walking down lanes sometimes in the middle of the street sometimes out on a country road she would just be around like it gets to the point that her sisters who are avid teetotalers they try and get her to take these like pledges of temperance and like at the time it's basically seen as if you sign your name and you agree that that's all you need. It's going to make you magically not be an alcoholic and not be addicted to booze. <gasps> okay, cool, that's... Mm-hmm. Abstinence doesn't fucking work, lads, by the way. Just saying. But yeah. When Emily Ruth, her oldest daughter, is 12, she gets ill and looks like scarlet fever and clearly something I think this triggered something in Annie because this is, reminds her of the time when she lost so much and then when the doctor comes he tells her it's meningitis so she knows her child's gonna die and she takes solace in the bottle of course she fucking does because she's an alcoholic so she starts drinking and off she goes. And one day when she's drowning her sorrows, Emily dies and she's not with her and she is found wandering. <sighs> Between the villages, they find her and it's this that leads her to go to a sanatorium. So she gets placed in basically a priory so she goes, she's supposed to detox and get out of it. And apparently she does pretty well there. She's respectful, she's polite, she doesn't drink, she doesn't try and sneak in stuff. John visits her. Like, things are pretty nice considering. And she is determined. Like, she is fully on board. She doesn't want to drink anymore. Her sisters are all like, she's a changed woman. She's one of us. She's teetotal. She's fabulous. She's a pioneer. And things are going well for a long time. Until John gets a cold. He gets a cold one day. And he still has to go out and look after the horses and do his bit. That wasn't an intentional pun. And he decides, you know what? I'm going to have a little snifter. A wee hot toddy. And he does. But before he leaves, he does what he does every day. And gives his wife a kiss. Just before he steps out the door. And it is then that she tastes the whiskey on his lips. And this? This just starts a downward spiral. She 
one way or another, she starts drinking. I don't know if there was any booze in the house. Well, there must have been some because he had a whiskey. But she ends up drinking and she ends up wandering. And at this point, the Barrys, they're doing pretty well for themselves. And it would be worse than disrespectful, worse than everything else. And they had to get rid of Annie. And John had a choice. He had to choose his wife or his occupation. And the two of them, they make a decision to separate. And so they do. And she leaves. And she heads for London. But things ended, I don't want to say amicably, but probably as amicably as they could because John is paying her 10 shillings a week, which is more than most would have gotten in any form of separation. He is ensuring that he is supporting her. Because it seems like John truly did love her. And so Annie, although having, you know, enough money to cover those like middle class treats that she'd become accustomed to. That 10 shillings generally went towards booze. And when she's living with her family, her pioneering teetotal abstinent family... Yeah, that's, that's going to go, it's going to go really fucking well. No, it's absolutely not. It did not go well. So she gets the heck out of Dodge and she ends up, well, out of Knightsbridge. And this is a woman now who is on the streets of London. She's had to leave her husband and her children. She can't go back to her family. Everything about her is shameful according to Victorian standards. She's not a good wife, a dutiful wife, a good mother. She has an addiction and that is just a fucking sin. How dare she? Like, oh, I'm so mad at Victorians. I'm so mad. She just was seen as less than. And then she finds comfort in a man, John Sivvy. And she gets called Mrs Sivvy. They end up lodging together and a lot of their money goes to booze because both of them are alcoholics they lean on each other it's a toxic codependent relationship I guess but it's all she has and so she's with him and and she's got her 10 shillings from John but she's also got her crochet and embroidery and her needlework which she sells at markets like she sells this she's got a skill you know something came handy told you it would come back around and that's how she supplements like her lifestyle her living but also in addition furthermore again remember that according to you know victorian standards she's an adulteress at this point because by 1886 you know, they, they should be fine. They've got John's money. Sivvy's working. She's selling her crochet and shit. Like, they should be very comfortable. But they're staying in, like, the dodgy part of London because they're buying loads of booze. But in December 1886, the money stops. The 10 shilling, it's, it just ceases. And it's then that Annie finds out that John Chapman is ill deathly ill on his deathbed in fact and Annie walks 25 miles in two days like in fucking winter in England she is going to see her husband like she has to go to him and she does and she sees him and I mean it's not going to be a pleasant reunion but clearly the two of them cared for each other see she finds out that he had retired six months earlier And it was only when he could not physically get out of his bed that he stopped sending her her support. And when she visits him, she sees that he too has succumbed to alcoholism and he's suffering psoriasis of the liver. When John dies and Annie returns to London, she is distraught, she is distressed, she's sobbing. And it's not just the money. This is someone who was an important part of her life, the father of her children. It mattered to her. 
And not long after her return, Sivy leaves. Their relationship is over. Whether because she didn't have the extra money or because she was clearly inconsolable over this. The following year, Annie is clearly suffering from tuberculosis. She had consumption and it is really, really affecting her to the point where she can't crochet or knit or embroider. She's not able to sell her wares and she is struggling on the streets of Whitechapel. And every penny is spent on the demon drink. Dark Annie's demon drink. And she couldn't bring herself to go back to her family. She couldn't even consider her staying in the tuberculosis ward. Anything that could have helped her. But when things are dark and awful and you're struggling and suffering, you don't make good decisions. And Annie, now a widow, she starts a relationship up with um, this dude Stanley, who ends up, you know, footing her bill for like her lodging house and things like that. To the point where he like tells the owner, like the deputy manager, the steward, if you will, whatever, you know, to make sure she doesn't go with any men because he's just like, nope, she's mine. Uh, and by all accounts, Annie didn't go with any men. Like there is no record of her anywhere of her soliciting or selling sex or any of that. There is no record of her being a prostitute during her life. Not one. But for whatever reason, on the 7th of September, Annie, she doesn't have the bill fitted for her. Stanley isn't paying. And Annie had managed to get a couple of pennies off her, off her brother Fontaine. Uh, and instead of paying for her lodgings, she got beer. And Donovan, who ran the lodging house, he kicked her out. And he sent her out onto the streets. And Annie was no stranger to sleeping rough like a lot of these women. Sometimes you just had to do what you had to do. And so she heads to the yard near Hanbury Street. She goes through the gate and she goes to sleep. And it is then her life is ended. And so ends the story of Dark Annie, Annie Chapman the second canonical victim of Jack the Ripper. A woman whose life was not just dotted with tragedy, it was rained on, it was showered on, it was a fucking monsoon. And I'm not even sure if there was anything that could have been done to combat that. Not with the way society was, not with the way they were conditioned, not with the way women were treated. And that makes me so fucking mad. So what did we learn today? We learned that Victorian society fucking sucks. That John Chapman was, by all accounts, a good husband. And that if you were struggling from mental illness or addiction problems, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult, no matter how desperate they may seem, please get help. Please reach out to somebody like, I'm the worst person to talk to because I have struggled with many issues in my life. But even... God, even talk to me. Jesus, if it helps. Like, I'm not the most relatable or, or, or you know, considerate person in the world, but fuck. You're struggling? Call the Samaritans. Call somebody. Jesus, email me. Like, I, I will talk to you if you need it. Like, I am not, not the best... A person at giving advice because clearly um, I am a puddle of despair but it's fine just take a moment longer it's all you need just one moment after another after another it's just moments just keep going but okay so that so ends the story of Dark Annie and if you fuck liked this retelling, liked my information, liked me getting really mad, uh, please rate and review five stars on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all that jam. Leave, re leave good reviews. Please say nice things. If not, just talk about how shit people are. Like, I don't care. I do care. I actually care quite a lot. Too much, some might say. But 
let's just skip to the reviews because I'm too mad. For reading. You know what? Read China Rich Girlfriend because honestly, if you need some joy in your life, the Crazy Rich Asians trilogy is just fantastic. For watching, there is a show called Roar on um on Apple and it makes me mad but it's 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 a good venting thing and for listening just listen to Taylor Swift because I think we all need that in our lives okay good good talk everybody now um I am gonna bid you all farewell adios au revoir au revoir my friends bye-bye